let's talk about the prostate. Physiologically, the gland is pretty underwhelming. Maybe some sugary alkaline secretions for the semen sailing, but besides that, let's face it, it just likes to cause problems. The prostate gland is located at the apex of the bladder and surrounds the proximal urethra. That's right, it completely envelopes that little pee tube, right where it leaves the bladder. Most men have some degree of gland hypertrophy later in life, so, you know, just an overall awkward situation for all organs involved. To learn a thing or two about prostate pathology, let's catch up with our inept but brave firefighters at the BPH Firehouse, this time dealing with the most harrowing experience that a firefighter can face. A cat stuck in a tree. Climb up there and grab it, spray it down, chop the tree, smoke it out even, so many options. First up, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. When the gland grows in size and hugs that urethra, just like the rotund fire chief wrapping his girth around that lamppost, BPH is an extremely common condition that becomes more prevalent with increasing age. About 50% of men over 50 and 80% of men over 80. You get the idea. BPH is characterized by enlargement of the prostate, usually occurring in the transitional zone, the inner area of the prostate that surrounds the urethra. To remember the transitional zone, just think of this transit sign sitting right against that urethral pole. The transitional zone includes the middle and lateral lobes of the prostate, which is emphasized by the midday and late bus times on the sign below. Enlargement of this area leads to constriction of the flow of urine, or bladder outlet obstruction. BPH is caused by stimulation of prostatic epithelial and stromal cells by dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, a potent androgen. In the prostate gland, the enzyme 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone into DHT. Kind of like this fire alpha team volunteer here, using that testosterone wrench to turn on that dihydro T-shaped fire hydrant. DHT works locally to stimulate growth of the gland. This results in an increase in both the glandular components, as well as the fibromuscular stroma around the glands. Microscopically, you'll see an increase in the number of glandular epithelial cells, and more of that fibrostroma, as well as an increase in the number of stromal smooth muscle cells. Notice that we're talking about hyperplasia here, not hypertrophy. We're increasing cell number. Hyperplasia of glandular epithelial cells is represented by those proliferating glandular-looking clovers. And to remind you of smooth muscle cell hyperplasia, we've added some scattered smooth muscle-shaped leaves from the tree above. On histology, you'll actually be able to see little hyperplastic nodules with proliferation of both stromal and epithelial components. Remember, these nodules are microscopic. The prostate will be nice and smooth on gross pathology and on digital rectal exam. Any nodularity or asymmetry of the gland should immediately raise suspicion of cancer. More on that in just a little bit. First, let's talk about BPH symptoms. So obviously, we're dealing with bladder outlet obstruction. This results in hesitancy, or difficulty starting a stream of urine, weak urinary stream, or dribbling, urgency, that I gotta go feeling, frequency, and nocturia, needing to get up in the night to urinate. See all that water backing up into the kidney tank, dilating that ureteral hose? In a small percentage of patients, chronic untreated BPH can lead to urinary retention with bilateral hydronephrosis, which can cause acute kidney injury and even renal failure. Plus, imagine all that stagnant urine. Recurrent urinary tract infections can also occur, though this is rare. A digital rectal exam will demonstrate a smooth, symmetrically enlarged prostate without nodules or tenderness. Just think of this smooth, symmetrically enlarged fire hose over here. Just a training exercise gone horribly wrong. The bladder outlet obstruction in the setting of BPH has two components. First, there's static obstruction due to the proliferation of epithelial and stromal cells. This is mediated by androgens. The second component is dynamic obstruction. As a result of contraction of prostate smooth muscle, this is mediated by alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Treatment of BPH targets both of these processes. Alpha adrenergic antagonists, such as terazosin and tamsulosin, work to relax the smooth muscle. At Sketchy, our recurring symbol for alpha-1 blockade is a single extinguished alpha candle. Also, to remind you of that Osin suffix, we depict the Osin alpha-1 blockers with an opera singer. See how he's stepping on those smooth muscle cells? Just gotta relax that muscle. These drugs have no effect on prostate volume, though. That's the job of our second class of BPH drugs, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, such as finasteride and dutasteride. Just think of this asteroid, asteroid hurling towards the 5-alpha fire volunteer. By inhibiting 5-alpha reductase, these drugs block the conversion of testosterone to DHT, which, in turn, decreases the size of the glandular and stromal components of the gland. In other words, these do decrease prostate volume. BPH can also be managed surgically. 
usually with transurethral resection of the prostate, also called a TERP. All right, so we've got a lot of cellular proliferation going on. We've got hormonal stimulation. Notice that I didn't say anything about cancer. BPH is not a precursor to prostate cancer. So what's the deal with prostate cancer then? For that, we're bringing out the cancer crab jaws of life. Excessive? Maybe. That guy back there seems to be pretty entertained, though. Let this super supportive community member holding the big number one foam finger remind you that prostate adenocarcinoma is the most common cancer in men in the U.S. and the second most common cause of cancer death among men in the U.S. The most important risk factor is increasing age. Prostate cancer is much more rare in individuals under the age of 40. But incidence increases progressively in later decades. Autopsy studies have shown that 14 to as many as 70% of individuals, age 60 to 70 years, have an occult prostate cancer just hiding out down there. Most of these cancers will never become clinically significant. Alas, in an age where more people recognize the acronym PSA than the Village People's YMCA, widespread screening for prostate cancer means that many of these occult malignancies are detected, even though they will likely never become clinically meaningful in a patient's lifetime. Besides age, family history of prostate cancer is also an important risk factor, particularly first-degree relatives, which is why this prostate superfan has brought along his son to catch a glimpse of the action. Prostate cancer is also more common in black men. Not only that, cancer presents sooner and at a later stage in these individuals. Smoking is also a risk factor, probably in a dose-dependent fashion. Notice what isn't a risk factor for prostate cancer. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. Just remember that the word benign is in there. Prostate cancer is often asymptomatic in early phases. It's usually located in the peripheral zone of the prostate in the posterior lobe, away from the urethra. So a localized tumor rarely causes urinary symptoms. We've emphasized the peripheral zone with peripheral zone tape, cordoning off the scene. We even tied it to a post mailbox to remind you of posterior lobe. The location in the peripheral zone makes tumors more likely to be palpated on digital rectal exam. Asymmetry, palpable nodules, or areas of induration are suggestive of cancer. Just think of this guy palpating the surface of that nodular tree. As he, uh, not really sure what his plan is there. Contrast this with the symmetrically enlarged and firm gland associated with BPH. When prostate cancer does become symptomatic, it usually indicates advanced disease. Extension into the bladder or other nearby structures can cause urinary symptoms similar to BPH. But remember, it's usually asymptomatic in early stages of disease, isolated to the periphery of that gland, away from the urethra. If your patient has frequency, urgency, and or nocturia, that's probably the BPH talking. Prostate cancer spreads to bone early, especially the vertebrae, via direct spread through the lymphatics and veins. As depicted by our next firefighter here, ascending that spine ladder, the first manifestation is usually back pain. METs characteristically cause osteoblastic, or bone-producing, lesions, rather than osteolytic lesions, which are more like punching holes in the bone. Osteoblastic METs are highlighted by the osteobuilder here, rushing to the firefighter's aid. All right, time for a little PSA about PSA. PSA is produced by the epithelium of the prostate and can be detected at higher levels in the blood due to many conditions such as BPH, prostatitis, normal sexual activity, and even prostate cancer, but it is not specific. Nevertheless, PSA is still used by many clinicians to screen for prostate cancer, although more cancers are found this way. It's unclear if the benefits of early detection outweigh the morbidity of working up and treating these often non-life-threatening occult malignancies. Although the use of PSA for screening is controversial, it's clearly an excellent tumor marker in men with established diagnosis of prostate cancer. PSA is a very sensitive marker for recurrent prostate cancer in these patients. On histology, prostate cancer usually demonstrates well-defined glands. This is an adenocarcinoma after all. The glands are usually crowded together, with cells exhibiting darker cytoplasm and large nuclei. Treatment usually includes surgical removal of the prostate, radiation therapy, and in some cases, treatment to deprive the prostate of androgens. One way to starve that prostate of those sweet, sweet androgens is with continuous administration of a long-acting GnRH analog, such as luprolide. Just think of the continuous, long-lasting service that Gardner's Hardware has provided the community. You see, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, is normally secreted in a pulsatile fashion from the hypothalamus. This stimulates LH and FSH release from the anterior pituitary. LH goes on to stimulate the testes to produce testosterone. Continuous, rather than pulsatile GnRH stimulation, however, inhibits the anterior pituitary, thus leading to less androgen production downstream. 
hence the cracked glass in front of the male symbol-shaped tools in the window. Well, I know that cat isn't any closer to being saved from that tree, but it's time to bring our story to a close. Just leave it on a cliffhanger, I guess. All right, time to head upstairs, to that big, distended organ feeling all the brunt of that prostate pressure. The bladder. 